I do the advisor, Eduardo Conex, and just to give you a brief background of his research and what he's working on, he's uh, currently an associate professor in the telematics and electronics engineering department at the Technical University of Madrid. Uh, he's also the vice director of the Research Center of Software Technologies and Multimedia System, where you can see he conducts all his research. And his main interests are uh, include machine learning algorithms for tissue classification, which he will probably need to introduce throughout this seminar. He also uh, is interested in electronic design of high performance embedded systems for real time medical multimodal processing devices, and also for real time algorithms for photometric video and magnetic, magnetic resonance in its registration. So, with that being said, please give. Let's give a warm welcome to the Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, our research on brain cancer detection using hyperspectral imaging. Many, many thanks to so let's take in with this uh, talk on hyperspectral image and video processing in neurosurgery at the helicoid Nemesis 3DCM and Stratum Research Plant. So let's start. Uh, as, as human beings, our uh, visual system is based basically on the standard some parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The light uh, passes through the lens, goes through the vitreous humor, and arrives to the retina, where it defines uh, two types of uh, cells, the cones and the bones. The cones are the ones responsible for the acquisition of the cones, and they are tuned in three types of wavelengths, uh, blue, green, and um, right, so uh, human beings are said to be three chromatic, right? Because we uh, sample these three wavelengths. The spectrum range in our case goes approximately from 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers. The different uh, animal species, they have uh, their own visual systems that are adapted in their uh, particular circumstances. For instance, if we uh, consider uh, dolphins or whales or seals, uh, they are not able to differentiate the colors. They are just able to differentiate uh, these different levels of luminosity. So they are said to be monochromatic. And the reason for that basically is that uh, the colors disappear very fast with uh, the depth in the sea. So at approximately 38 meters, there is no problem. So they have adapted. Additionally, if we consider the big mammals, the horses, cows, uh, bulls, uh, they have a visual system that is able to sense only two wavelengths. They are said to be deep rock. They have photoreceptors only for these two ways. So if we compare how, uh, for instance, a dolphin sees the rainbow, this will be the case. It is a monochromatic rainbow. And if we see how a horse is going to see the rainbow, that will be the rainbow of a big chromatic. Now, in the animal system, it is worth mentioning what happens with birds, because in that case, birds are tetrachromatic. They have four photoreceptors, right? Sense to the four red wavelengths. And those are a special case in this situation because they have five photoreceptors, five different types of photoreceptors. And that dotted line here, this one, corresponds to the wavelength that those are, are also sensitive. So, uh, one, two, three, four, five 
different types of photoreceptors. And even more, there are some small animals that can sense even more wavelengths. But where is the, where is the? Okay, in way as to the materials, and in particular to the semiconductors. Semiconductors, they do not have this evolution of the If we look at uh, silicium, um, indium, gallium, arsenide, uh, the possibilities we have here are because if we plot the uh, blue, the green, and the red wavelengths here, we see that there is space for many more wavelengths. For all these wavelengths here that may be conducted a nice sensor of many different wavelengths. And what's more, it is that silicium, for instance, the range is wider than our uh, visual system because the limit goes up to 1,000 nanometers, not 800 nanometers. And for the indium zanium arsenide, the limit is around 1,700 nanometers. So we have sensors, and when we see what happens with a normal image, a normal image consists of three bands, right? Uh, red, green, and blue. But if we consider multispectral, or hyperspectral images, they consist of tens or hundreds of bands. And those hundreds of bands are obtained using these semiconductors. Uh, these diffuse reflectance, in that case, that we can see here, is a continuous plot. And that continuous plot is called the spectral signature of that material. And we can differentiate materials just looking at this spectral signature. And therefore, we are able also to differentiate the tissues. If there is a healthy tissue or a pathological tissue, we can make the differentiation study these spectral signatures. Uh, in the literature, there has been many proposals, technologies to capture this spectral information. Just uh, Without getting into the details, we have the spot scanning, we have the line scanning, we have the band sequential scanning, and the snapshot. And the snapshot is a way to capture the spatial and the spectral information in only one zone. And for that, uh, one of the technologies, what is doing is on a CMOS sensor, is growing. Uh, how it is with different height to filter the light. So build filters on top of a CMOS sensor in order to capture the information. What's interesting with this? What is interesting is that we are in not just to get an image, but to get a DB. Because we get 15, 30 hyperspectral cubes per second, and that's hyperspectral field. So it means that if we have this spectral information coming at the video, and we process also very fast that information, we will have our classification also shown as videos as typically we see the information. So after this very short introduction uh, about the spectral technology, I would like to introduce the, the agenda. First, uh, I will go through the challenges uh, we believe neurosurgeons currently face. Then, I will introduce the lessons we have learned in two different projects. One is the medical project, and the other one is the Nemesis 3D CM, so the Nemesis project uh, will be involved. And these two projects converge in the one which we are working, that is the stratum project. At last, I will just detail what is our current going to search, and I will draw some conclusions. So, uh, neurosurgery is the basic procedure carried out to treat brain. 
uh, neurosurgeons try to completely resect the brain. And for that, they use as guiding tool the intraoperative neuromedication. And this intraoperative neuromedication is based on preoperative magnetic resonance. So they use these tools, they find where is the uh, brain tumor, and they try to resect it. During this operation, they probably take a piece of the tumor, and then they send a piece of tumor, they biopsy, to the uh, pathological department to make a pathological analysis. They use the microscope, and with this analysis, they are able to determine what is the type of cells uh, that are present in that sample. And with those type of cells, they determine the type of tumor and the grade of that tumor. They are classified in different grades. In case we have primary tumors, if it is metastasis, they are able to determine what is the origin of the tumor. Uh, complete reception of tumors is the key for patient survival. Uh, that's always what uh, neurosurgeons try to achieve. But what happens is that sometimes when they try to make the complete resection, what happens is that some vital tissues are affected so they cannot remove that and they try to minimize what is left in the brain of the patient. To determine what is the vital tissue and what is not, they typically use the intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring that is able to guide on this resection. Uh, neurosurgeons uh, find really difficult uh, to identify the boundaries between the healthy tissue and the pathological tissue, especially in glioblastomas, especially with tumors that have a diffuse nature and that are infiltrated with the cartilage. So there is not like having a ball. There's no ball, there's no limit. It's like a region in which they need to remove that uh, tumor. Of course, in the state of the art, uh, we have some tools to help the surgeon. There are some con contrast agents that can be applied to the patient that provides a signal that is uh, marked the region. But what happens with these contrast agents, different types of them, uh, is that sometimes they have uh, side effects. Sometimes these signals that we see here just appear for certain time periods. <clears throat> so we have a problem. We have a necessity in this case. And the necessity is that we need to develop accurate acquisition and visualization systems. We need to have these systems that running algorithms in real time can provide at the operating room this accurate delimitation between the hard field and the field. That's one of the challenges. And uh, there is another one. Uh, when one gets into an operating room, it's full of different uh, 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 machinery elements, tools. And the problem is that the final decision always remains in the uh, expertise of the neurosurgeon. And that's, there's no way to integrate currently the information that comes from these different machines but the brain of the surgeon. And of course, there are uh, different uh, equipment that is uh, helping the neurosurgeons, for instance, intraoperative ultrasound or intraoperative magnetic resonance imaging. But uh, at the end, they do not provide this integration. So we also need uh, the integration of the 3D models they are providing, and I want to uh, highlight this 3D aspect of the information. <clears throat> Magnetic resonance image is a volume. What we get with the ultrasound image is also a volume that needs to be located in the space. And that is something that currently, okay, surgeons, they do 
in their brain, but it is just them what are integrating all this information. So we need to integrate this information and we need algorithms that in real time integrate and register these different sources. So if we try to envision what is an ideal solution for these challenges, what we have is to a solution in which we can have, for instance, different hyperspectral cameras, either at the uh, microscope uh, level or at the macroscope level. And we combine that with uh, depth sensors, depth sensors to capture the volume of the scene we have in front of us. If we combine that with artificial intelligence solutions based on machine learning algorithms that guide this integration, because of course it's difficult, of course it is done only on the brain, in the brain of the surgeons, but we can try to achieve that also using this type of tools and helping also for the registration or registering the different uh, 3D types of sources we have. If we also have the pre-operative information of the patient, these volumes we have that can help to render the information to the surgeon. And thinking on the real-time aspect, we combine the different types of acceleration platforms, for instance, GPUs, FPGAs, and multiple to build a high-performance computing model. And now that provides the 3D feedback to the surgeons, in which, among other things, they are able to delineate, for instance, this healthy tissue and this pathological tissue, and have this immersive view of what is happening, this three-dimensional view, combining, for instance, the information they get currently for the pre-operative magnetic and rational image of the patient. So, these are the challenges. We have seen hyperspectral imaging. I would like now to introduce the lessons we have uh, learned in the, the different parts. The first one is the helicoid project. The helicoid project was uh, a European project, a project in which different uh, partners in different countries uh, collaborate to achieve the circuit. So the, what was the, the goal of the helicoid? The goal was basically to discriminate between healthy and malignant tissues in real time. Okay? Because we can probably do that if we have a lot of that. But the problem is to have the neurosurgeon at the operating room. Because if we provide an answer to the neurosurgeon two hours later, that's too late. Have to make a decision in that. So, in order to do that, we develop a demonstrator for intraoperative brain cancer surgeries. Just to give you an overview, in the Helicoid project, there were uh, nine partners, four universities for three different countries Spain, France, and UK, uh, two university hospitals, one from UK and Spain to small, medium-sized companies, uh, one from Spain, one from the Netherlands, and one big medical company as Metronic. This is the demonstrator of Helicon, and in this uh, demonstrator, there are uh, four systems. The first system is the acquisition scanning platform that in turn consists of the system, the camera scanning platform, and two hyperspectral cameras. There is the control system. The control system is where it is a security tool of the software for the administrator. The data processing subsystem, we want or we want it to achieve real time, so it means that we need to accelerate and we use that platform was a multi-core platform with cluster of processing elements to accelerate the classification algorithms. And also, we have the user interface to provide the information to the neurosurgeons. 
two hyperspectral cameras, line scan cameras, so we have to move the cameras to get the information of the scene, one in the visible near infrared range from 400 to 1000 nanometers and with more than 825 spectral bands. The other camera, the near infrared range from 900 to 1700 nanometers and having more than 170 spectral bands. So we have actually a lot of resolution at the spectral side. Uh, I show you the uh, side view of the prototype and the rear view. We can see here the two cameras. Also, we can see this part here is the light source, uh, cables here at the optical fibers to place the light on top of the pacing head. Here we can see the control system, and this box here corresponds to the MPPA, the Massively uh, Parallel Processing Array System, we were using to accelerate the processing of the of the array. Uh, we have here the uh, demonstrator at the operating room at the uh, University Hospital in the Canary Islands. And here we have uh, uh, Ma uh, Favelo, one of the PhD students at that moment, using the demonstrator. J just to say that in all these pro uh, projects, the collaboration with the uh, neurosurgery departments in the different uh, uh, university hospital has been great. There has been no problem. The PhD students who are the ones that uh, are in the daily work, they have been at the operating room, they keep working at the operating room, and they have captured a lot of information with the help of the neurosurgery. It has been a very positive collaboration in all the three. So uh, how it is the helicoid brain cancer detection algorithm? This is the, the, the block diagram. So there are different stages. Uh, the first one is the pre-processing to calibrate, to uh, reduce the, the noise. Then we have an algorithm to reduce the dimensionality of the data. I have mentioned before, we have more than 800 uh, wavelengths, so we have a space of 800 dimensions at least, so we don't want to work with that because that's really complex. So we solve that problem and we change from the hyperspectral image to a one-band representation here of that image obtained with this uh, reductional, dimensional reduction algorithm. Then we use a supervised classification. We use a support vector machine. And with that support vector machine, we get probabilities. This pixel here, what is the probability that this pixel belongs to this class, to this class, or to this class? And with that, we get a supervised classification map. What happens is that this map is really noisy. Uh, we see the map and it's something difficult to make decisions. So we have one stage here that is the uh, nearest major uh, filter in there. And with that part, we are able to obtain the spatial spectral supervised classification map that is a kind of a smooth classification map from this supervised classification. Then that's the supervised uh, branch of the algorithm. We have another branch that is unsupervised. In fact, this algorithm is kind of hybrid algorithm that is using supervised and unsupervised classification. In this branch, we get this segmentation map, no meaning with the different regions, and we get the final helicoid density map using majority bond. Go. Functionally, was good. We got uh, nice classification maps, but the processing time was huge. So we need to do something. We need to fine tune this algorithm. And the fine tuning was first the pre-processing. Do we need all that stuff? Well, yes, but we can do 
something good also if we reduce the complexity. So the first step was to reduce the complexity of the three processing stack. That uh, we have different pieces of the prototype, so we need to communicate the hyperspectral cubes from one part of the system to another. The transmission of that information is also a problem. In the previous algorithm, we had two types of hyperspectral cubes communicating to different parts. So here we have just one type of hyperspectral cube that is simultaneously being sent to the dimensionality reduction and to the classification algorithm. Next, we change the algorithm to reduce the dimensionality. Instead of the fancy, very well adapted algorithm, we came back to a PCA, principal component analysis, in this domain, basic algorithm to, to do this because it's simple. Because, okay, we don't get the better result, but we get good enough results for what we want. Then we also reduce the two algorithms we were using for the um, clustering, and we get just one with the K-means clustering. And we get a density map, the helical density map that is okay. It was enough to do that, so let's see what were the results. This is uh, uh, the results we get for this uh, patient. This is before the uh, brain tumor is removed. And this is after the removal of the brain tumor or during the removal of the brain tumor. So first we have normal tissue, the capture number one, the capture number two. We see the glioblastoma grade four that was this patient had. So these are the results we get with the algorithm. Here, green means uh, healthy tissue, red means uh, pathological tissue. So functionally, it is working. But if we go to the table, seeing the processing time, uh, we see that, uh, OK, uh, there is uh, 42 seconds for the first capture and 52 seconds for the pathological capture. Okay, for the brain tumor. So, of course, far away from real time, it is good if we think on a surgical time, something that we do from time to time, and it takes probably, considering also the movement of the cameras, other minute, takes three minutes to get the result. That can be good, but then it is just sampling what is happening from time to time. Um, what we would like to achieve is really to have, to have a classification that, that is like a bill okay, that we are getting in the moment. So we validate the algorithm for this validation. We use different models. Here the columns, what they represent are the different models. First column corresponds to only uh, training with glioblastoma. The second one, with all the primary tumors we were able to get, glioblastoma, meningioma. And then the third corresponds to secondary tumor. Uh, those are metastases. And the third one is taking all the information we got and try to make a model, uh, see how it works. And we tested this with normal pain, with glioblastoma, and with uh, many genomes. Uh, the result is all models, except the secondary tumor model, are able to discover where is the pathological tissue. So that's really good result, but uh, we are far from the hyperspectral video, from the real time. We are in this surgical time, that can be good, can be good, but it's not what we really want to achieve. So the project finished here, and OK, we came back home and began to think in new problems. Always I think in a research center, that's uh, daily life. I finish a project, but I have to think before it finishes when uh, I will have the funding for the new office. So we were thinking that, that that's the same. Maybe. So we were thinking on the new funding. And for the new funding, we were thinking, OK, that's good to have uh, this result, but we need really to go to the direction of achieving the real-time 
uh, processing to, to help the, the neurosurgeons. So, in Nemesis, uh, that was the, the new project. And in this project, the, the goal was to provide an immersive 3D model to virtually navigate the brain in real time. We added this idea that what matters really in this case is this human information because what they use, the magnetic resonance image for neurosurgeons, uh, that's a volume. Even if we see the different cuts, the, the, the axial, but that's a volume. So we need to register our information to that point we want to know. That was the first objective. And the second objective, to delineate brain tumors and other pathologies. So keep doing this. And of course, in, in real time. In this case, uh, it was funded not uh, for the European, from the European Commission. It was funded at the uh, regional level. So small consortium, just university hospital, one of the uh, hospitals in, in Madrid, big hospital covering probably a population of one million people. So really uh, big stuff and our research. So uh, if we try to recap the, the lessons we learned in, in the first book in, in Helicon, okay? First, there we were using line scan cameras, okay? They, so they are good, they have very nice spectral resolution, 800 pounds more even, but they are slow, we need to move them. And if we need to move them, how we are going to achieve this hyperspectral video, we cannot do you know, so we decided to use snapshot cameras in this case. But what happened with the snapshot cameras? Okay, they are good, but since we build the filters on top of the CMOS sensor, we, we, we have just a few wavelengths. And, and when I say a few, it's just 25 wavelengths compared to the 800. So we know that that's a, a drawback. And something we have to especially look at if we want to have some performance. Second, uh, the helical algorithm. Uh, I have shown you the block diagram. Complex algorithm, achieve surgical time, difficult really to achieve the real time. Uh, so here we try to simplify the algorithms because it's the only way at the end to achieve this uh, real-time performance. But what we do not want is to lose performance. We want to keep the test score. We want to do something similar using 25 bands that would work really well with uh, the 800 bands. Because probably it's not just having more wavelengths, what is providing you the possibility to make the differentiation between the high and pathological disease. Then in Hedgehog, there were no 3D models, no immersiveness. So what we add in Nemesis was depth sensors. Uh, the, the special type of depth sensors that are called uh, time of flight. And we tested also camera arrays to capture this volume information. And at last, uh, we need to accelerate the algorithms. Of course, we need to go faster. We were using in Hedgehog, the MPPN, this cluster of processing elements, and the main limiting factor in that case was the small amount of shared memory between the processing elements. There were 16 elements shared in some part of memory, but it was too small. So just filling that memory was a pain. We were not able to really go faster, not because we do not have the computational power, but because we do not have the data to compute because we were losing the time just filling that memory. So we decided, let's go to off the self system. Let's try to build an heterogeneous platform using either GPUs or FPGAs. And this is one of the prototypes we developed, okay? This is one prototype in which we have a snapshot camera, and we decided also to use a line scan camera, not because we are not looking for the real time, but because we want to double check our results. Because we want to see, okay, what happened if I would use the line scan camera with regard to this uh, snapshot camera and to compare the performance of the algorithms. 
Uh, this is a LIDAR. So we introduce an element for capturing this volume information. With that LIDAR comes also an RGB camera. So we can have also the information from the RGB camera. Uh, we need to develop the mechanical part to Cesium, the cameras, top of the head of the patient. This is the light source. And of course, with the light source, we need the optical fibers and the PC with the GPUs in which we were doing the computation because there is no way to uh, get the data out of the operating room to a supercomputing center and coming back. That was not possible. That was a first prototype, and that was, this is a new prototype. This is the current prototype we are uh, using here. We have simplified mainly the mechanical part. We do not have two actuators, just one actuator. It's more simply the movement of the cameras, and we still have the, this is the snapshot camera and the live scan. So if um, we come back to the spatial spectral uh, classification algorithm we were using, uh, it was mainly uh, formed by a PCA algorithm that was providing contextual information and a support vector machine that provides the probabilities that certain pixels belong to a certain class. Uh, this KNN algorithm is averaging the, prob the probabilities of different pixels. Those pixels are not close to each other. They are close from a spectral point of view. That's why we need the information coming from the PC. And that produces these results. Mm -hmm. Good, but the research question we asked ourselves here was what happened if we remove the KM and we remove the PCM? Because both of them, they are complex algorithms, and that's a drawback to achieve the real time processing. So if we remove this KM and we remove the PCA. Okay, we then have just one support vector machine. Now we know that that is not working. So what happened if we put several support vector machines working in parallel? And we try to <coughs> get the results because they have different results and we try to match those results. Imagine this is like if you have in the room three experts and you ask the same question to the three experts, probably there will be small differences, but they agree on the fundamentals, but probably there will be differences. And we try to see how those differences provide some improvement in our results. And what we got with this is the form. Here I will show you uh, the classification maps, for these two patients, 67 and 75, both of them, they had glioblastoma, uh, grade four. This is the ground truth. Uh, red means uh, where the uh, glioblastoma is located. Uh, green is the healthy tissue. And what we can see is with one SVM, the result is not good. Uh, we are not able to find where is the cube, right? But we knew that. But what happens when we use the tumor? Hey, in that moment, the tumor begins to be located. What happens is the behavior of the support vector machine is also not. It is very noisy. When we saw these results to the surgeons, they say, hey, it's good, but make a decision that's not good enough. So we said, okay, helicoid, we use a hybrid scheme in which we have the supervised and the unsupervised uh, branches. So let's do the same. And we added the k means algorithm. And in that case, we begin to smooth and to get better results. You see here the objective results 
uh, that corresponds to the three support vector machines are for the alien that they call. They are nice. I mean, they, we get numbers that are about 90 percent. Okay, so uh, I, I will show late, later in the moment you will see the real time of uh, how in real time these classification maps work. So uh, we were looking at the functionality, but what happens with the performance, with the uh, processing time of these algorithms? So for the support vector machine with uh, uh, radial basis uh, function as a kernel, we use different GPUs, and the processing time is less than three milliseconds. So we can put in parallel these three support vector machines. Each of them is going to be executed in less than three milliseconds. Even if we have to compute other things, we are opening the door. We need to process these 15, 30 hyperspectral cubes per second, and then to have this classification map in real time. Good, so that was the result we achieved with uh, the Genesis project. The way we collaborated with the uh, neurosurgeons was going to the clinical sessions regularly, uh, going to the operating room, and I have to say that this result is really a collaborative work. Uh, we achieved this because we were discussing with them, because we were really working together. And of course, uh, they are surgeons, they are busy people, but they, they were excited enough to, for the ideas of achieving this result that uh, they really uh, get involved in that. So as a result of that, uh, they also participate in this new project in Estrato. They are this university hospital, this neurosurgery department is also in Estrato, the new project that we are working in. in this project uh, has begun beginning this year, so we are just uh, beginning the research. And basically, the, object, the objective is to develop a 3D decision support tool for brain surgery guidance and diagnostic. And to achieve that, what we want is to develop not just one prototype, but three prototypes uh, that are going to be evaluated in a clinical study in three different uh, university hospitals. Uh, the consortium in this case is bigger. Uh, it is a 12 partner consortium with five universities from Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, and Germany. Germany, one uh, research center, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So we want to develop a high performance computed node really fitting to this task, we thought that it could be very interesting to also involve the patients. So one of the partners in the project is the European Citizen Science Association that is putting or linking the patients to the medical sector. There are two small, medium-sized company, one in the high-performance domain, men, and one that is manufacturing surgical uh, microscopes, atomic, and three different uh, hospitals, one in Sweden, the Karolinska University Hospital, and two in Spain, the hospital in the Canary Islands, and the hospital in, in Madrid. So, what are the uh, scientific objectives? First, foster personalized medicine. Second, to increase the intraoperative diagnostic accuracy of brain tumors. Third, to reduce surgery time. Fourth, to improve cost and energy efficiency of neurosurgical workflows. And of course, I have, uh, as I have mentioned, to evaluate in a clinical study the prototype in a two-year clinical study with more than 290 patients. What is the concept of this project? We want to develop 
course of a prototype and intraoperative imaging acquisition system. And in this case, we want to add the hyperspectral cameras to the microscope, to the surgical microscope. But we want also to get the volume information that uh, we see through the microscope. So we have the, uh, the hyperspectral cameras and some RGB cameras to get this information with an stereoscopic vision. We use uh, the macro also with the uh, hyperspectral uh, camera and the depth sensor, and we want to develop this high uh, performance computing processing platform, processing node to produce the results. Our objective is also to have an interactive 3D graphical interface uh, to uh, communicate the information to the neurosurgeons. Doing a similar exercise, uh, if we recap what we learned in Nemesis. Okay, there we use snapshot cameras, low uh, spectral resolution, but also low spatial resolution. We have the CMOS sensor, we build the filters, and that means that we are losing pixels for spatial resolution. We make micro pixels with these filters. So if we want to use this camera with a microscope, probably the image we get is not good enough. So in a struggle to get this higher spatial resolution, we need to do something for the surgical microscope. The idea of simple algorithms, that is something we borrow from Nemesis to Strato directly because that's a good direction to go. Time of flight, depth sensors, uh, good for the macro view of the scene, but we cannot use that sensor with a microscope. So in that case, we will use an array of cameras that are inserted. Um, in Nemesis, we were using GPUs and FPGAs, and in Stratum, we will design our own high-performance computing mode. Uh, in in Stratum, what uh, it is proposed for the spectral scanning is to use liquid crystal pneumon filters, because we want to take advantage of the high spatial resolution that we can get with a monochromatic sensor. So basically the idea is we use the filter uh, close to the light source, we illuminate the scene, and then we get this information into this uh, monochromatic sensor. Since we have the visible and the near infrared, we use a couple of them with the visible near infrared uh, light source and with the uh, near infrared light source. Also, the proposal, it is to use depth information to register the hyperspectral images with the RGB images we are getting and with the MRIs, right? And we will see later in the demo the preliminary results we have got uh, registering the classification maps of the uh, RGB videos we get and uh, how we are achieving the result of registering this hyperspectral classification on top of magnetic resonance that was obtained before the operation. Good. So we are just uh, uh, writing to the to the end, but before uh, some future ideas, what is the current work we are uh, I like this, this quotation for the next ideas, right? For the ongoing work. I keep your eyes on the start and your feet on the ground. So the, this is uh, the team, basically uh, five colleagues. We are uh, managing the work of these uh, seven PhD students. So I will... Uh, just state what are the research questions we are exploring for the different uh, students briefly and probably these days I will be here if there are more possibilities to discuss and you are interested to know more details, please just come and I will try to, to help you with that. So first, uh, with Alberto, 
that is that is here. So here, the uh, research question is: How we is the task of classification algorithms using a light source that is not homogeneous? Can we use spatially modulated light to improve this classification? And what we want to use is the SFDI principle. And to achieve that, what we have done is the development of uh, this prototype with the projector, the hyperspectral camera, to see what can we do. Second, with uh, Alejandro. With him, we are working with uh, simulations, with the numerical problems. But in this sense, can we <coughs> apply these simulations to the operating room? Okay? Can we find numerical efficient ways to solve the inverse problem but at the operating room for the exposed tissue? We have the hyperspectral camera. We capture the uh, diffuse reflectors. Can we solve the inverse problem? No. What is the ethical problems of the brain tissue that we have in front of us. <coughs> so we are working on algorithm try to uh, have uh, algorithms that can be computed easily in order to reduce the process of time. Third, with Gonzalo. Uh, with Gonzalo, we are working in hyperspectral microscopy. Uh, can we help pathologists to automate the intraoperative sample assessment with a hyperspectral microscope? Typically, this uh, intraoperative sample assessment for the pathology department, it takes 45 minutes. So that biopsy we get is not immediately that we know what type of tumor we have. It takes, let's say, almost one hour to, to get the result. These type of operations are long, they take probably five, six hours, even more. What it's about. So can we automate that and <clears throat> put in the loop these kind of tools at the operating So for that, uh, uh, a microscope has been adapted with a hyperspectral camera, and we are working with the pathologist at the university hospital to assess the urea with the samples they, they Fourth, with Guillermo, uh, okay, we use the classification algorithms. Uh, it is complex to make this classification with several classes. Okay, so can we really simplify the task of classification? For instance, uh, segmenting the blood vessels, removing this problem from the classification and transforming the <coughs> classification problem into a binary problem. And for instance, we get uh, these results here. Here, we are able to segment the craniotomy, we are able to segment the blood vessels, and then the problem we have for classification is simple because we do not classify a pixel that has been previously classified, segmented as a blood vessel. So we have less pixels. Classify that, that, to classify that is good for real-time performance. And then the false positives we can get have been also reduced. It's a way to push to the limits the classification already algorithm we are in. <clears throat> for fifth, with Manuel, uh, can we register at the operating room the patient hyperspectral base classification and the magnetic resonance? For that, uh, we are using the preclinical magnetic resonance equipment we have at the research center and different depth sensors. Okay, we are combining the information we get from these different depth sensors and building phantoms. Just to uh, put the phantom, uh, antenna of the magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, get the information, the volume information, use the hyperspectral camera and try to make it classification. Six, okay, we use uh, off-the-self snapshot camera, hyperspectral cameras, but can we envision 
new hyperspectral sensors. There are a new type of uh, sensors that are called event-based sensors. In these sensors, uh, we get information just when there is a change of frame. And can we uh, build 3D hyperspectral medical devices using these sensors. We uh, work in this PhD with a company that is in the north of Spain, in the Basque country, and these are the sensors. What we see here is the result of this sensor. This is a hand that is waving in front of the sensor, so we do not see actually the sun, the, the hand. What we see is how the uh, bone of the hand are moving and how we get changes in the illumination. So can we get enough information? Because in fact, that is a certain way how our visual system is working. And we can get much more speed with this type of sensors and also reduce the energy consumption. And at last, uh, we have the acceleration part uh, with power we ask ourselves, can we ease the acceleration of classification algorithms on a heterogeneous platform using kind of transformations, the code we use that are called polyhedral transformations. So just if uh, I have enough time, I show you the, the demos. Okay. This is one. Okay, so here, This is a classification map in real time for a patient with an glioblastoma. It was an aneurysm of this patient. This is the case. This just come back to this because this was for a patient with a glioblastoma. This part here is where the glioblastoma was. Let me just talk. This goes very fast. In this case, corresponds to the point cloud we get and the registration of the classification on top of that point cloud. For one patient and for another patient, in this case here, this is the RGB video we get. This is how it looks like the hyperspectral information. Um, here, what we have is the phantoms we are building for the registration of the hyperspectral images and the magnetic resonance. We use uh, just a material. We create the white matter, we create the gray matter, and we use those phantoms and the magnetic resonance and in uh, conjunction with the hyperspectral cameras. The procedure we follow for uh, registering uh, the information of the magnetic resonance imaging and the hyperspectral is the following. We capture the landmarks of the face of the patient. In those landmarks, we are able to register the depth information in yellow with the blue information. That's the scanning of that phantom that would correspond to the magnetic resonance image. And then once we move the, uh, the, the hyperspectral camera to the position, uh, that's the uh, augmented reality interface we have. That's we, once we move that, we are able to track that movement and then that position, and then to register the uh, hyperspectral image with the scanning of that phantom that corresponds to the magnetic resonance image. And at last, I think you have already seen this uh, demo uh, from Alberto, this is uh, how we, in this uh, prototype we have built, we achieve the uh, SFDI and capture the information and try to make 
the classification of this surface and generating the spatially modulated part. So, uh, I would like to uh, finish this talk uh, extracting some conclusions from the different projects, from Helicoid, Nemesis, from Stratum. Uh, our work it is basically trying to uh, help the neurosurgeons uh, in developing real-time diagnosis tools for in vivo human brain samples and doing this during neurosurgical operations. We have developed different demonstrators and with these demonstrators we have generated classification maps in real time that have been positively assessed by the researchers. And personally, I think that hyperspectral video provides a huge opportunity for multidisciplinary research in medical applications in which we have a high computational load. Of course, it can be the biophotonics community, it can be the machine learning community, the hardware and software architectures uh, community. All of these communities working together can really produce very nice devices to solve these problems. Uh, finally, uh, from a, um, as, a, as an engineer, as an engineer, I, I have to say that it's really very satisfying to uh, research in this uh, in this before I, I am just a big fan to all the people collaborating and working with us of course the students the colleagues and the different neurosurgeons that are collaborating at the hospital and of course many thanks to all of you thank you very much